I think we should continue. Um, the first lightning talk, which may be representing one of the work packages, the first work package of the project. Um, and I will start the presentation and then uh, Dr. Mary and Bella will, uh, will, will finish it up. Um, so this uh, first um, uh, work package in Promise, as I said before, used all these big data sets across Europe to uh, look at interrelationship between diet and depression. Uh, so we tried to test this model uh, and I will first highlight uh, the sort of relationship here in the middle, the relationship between food intake and food behavior, food related behavior in relationship to depression. And I will focus more on the prevention side. So this arrow, the first, the, the top arrow, while we also did uh, a lot of research in the other direction, but I will highlight that to a lesser extent today. So when we talk about the role of food intake in relationship to depression, you can look at food intake in different ways. First, of course, you can look at the nutrient status. So what is the status in the blood of the person, which is sort of the result of the intake of nutrients, but also the metabolism of nutrients. So that's one way to look at it. The second way is to look at the specific intake of food groups and of course that's very easy to give advice like eat more fish or eat more vegetables, that's what people know. So we focused on food groups as well. And then we also looked at complete dietary patterns so where we include everything that a person eats, the healthy parts, the unhealthy parts and the uh, in between uh, combinations and the distribution of that. So that is how we looked at food in relationship to depression. And just briefly summarizing the results, which is tough, but um, we looked with regard to the nutrient status in the blood, we looked at vitamin D, we looked at omega 3 and omega 6 levels, and we looked at vitamin B12. And the most consistent results we observed were omega 3, so the fish fatty acids, and the relationship with vitamin D and B12 was less clear, less consistent um, compared to the omega 3 ones. So that was an important finding. With regard to food groups, we looked at different food groups like uh, consumption of fish, consumption of vegetables, consumption of grains. And we noticed that people with a higher intake of these food groups were less likely to have depression or have lower depressive symptoms. While people who were eating a lot of sugar or a lot of sweets were uh, having a higher risk of depression or higher symptoms. So you really see a difference between sort of the healthy food groups and the unhealthy food groups. Then we also looked at the dietary patterns, and you can have a healthy dietary pattern, that's a pattern with a lot of fish and fruits and whole grains and olive oil, and all these type of patterns were related to depression. So if you had a higher score on all these healthy foods, you were uh, less likely to have depression or lower depressive symptoms. But for the unhealthy patterns, we did not really see very clear and consistent associations. So if you read to the relatively unhealthy, we could not see these uh, associations. Um, it's of interest, of interest actually to, to see that there were country differences in these type of associations. And we thought that was really important to explore because we have all these different data sets. For example, the high-fat, high-sugar diet, if you relatively eat a lot of high-fat and high-sugar project, uh, products. We saw that it was clearly linked to depression in the Netherlands, but not in the UK dataset. So sometimes you see this contrast, maybe these people eat different high fat, high sugar products, or it's linked to another factor related to depression, but it's interesting to explore and to see these inconsistencies. We also looked at eating styles, for example, emotional eating or external eating, and saw that that was linked to depression. So people who have more emotional eaters or uncontrolled eaters or external eaters have more depression and people who are more restrained eaters seem to have less depression. So the way you eat and in relation to your environment matters. We also looked at the role of obesity, finding very clear associations between obesity and depression. So the more obese a person was, the more likely this person was to have depression or develop depression. Also, Early life obesity <coughs> weight, so that was data from, uh, from Iceland where they have measured height and weight at young age, so that was linked to depression as well. 
But again, here we saw some differences between social environments because obesity and depression was linked, for example, in some uh, ethnic groups, but not in other ethnic groups. Now that is also of interest. So we saw it linked, for example, in, in Dutch, original Dutch people, but not in Turkish and Moroccan people. So why was that? And that was explored a little bit. And um, for example, um, the way you uh, uh, think about your own body, we know that that's related to obesity, and we know that that's related to depression, but you see also cultural differences in this body image that a person has. So some of these mechanisms may explain why obesity is related to depression in some populations, but not in other populations. So it's quite a complicated puzzle we explored, and I did not show you all the findings that we have. But one of the most important, I think, conclusions from this first work package was that a healthy dietary patterns are associated with depression. There was some indication that specific food groups were relevant. The role of an unhealthy dietary patterns were unclear and had some inconsistent findings. We saw no consistent role for vitamin D and B12, but perhaps something for omega-3. Unhealthy eating styles were associated with depression, so this uncontrolled eating or external eating, and obesity is associated with depression. So this is sort of very briefly the main conclusions of uh, this study. Now, of course, um, with these type of observational studies where you link one factor to depression, uh, dietary related factor to depression, it's very important that you confirm this finding in other studies. And that confirmation is especially important for observational studies. So that's the reason why we did also a sort of overarching uh, project using the data from the different cohorts all together. And uh, Dr. Mary Nicolau will uh, share you the important results of this analysis. So um, we performed what we call a harmonized meta analysis. And um, I'll explain what that is in a minute. Um, we used um, the five military cohorts um, to conduct this analysis, but we also had an external cohort from Australia that um, participated in it with us, which was very nice. And we looked at um, the association between dietary patterns and depressive symptoms um, cross-sectionally, so that means that we measured dietary patterns and depression at the same time point. And we also had two studies that looked at perspective associations, that means that we measured diet at um, the start point and then five or six years later looking at how depressive symptoms developed. Um, we used um, a standardized protocol, so what happened is we um, decided centrally how the analysis should be conducted at each of the individual study sites. We um, harmonized the way that we um, defined depressive symptoms, the way we defined the dietary patterns, which um, factors had to be included in the analysis as well, smoking or um, alcohol use, um, uh, age, sex, those kinds of factors. And every study did that, um, or every researcher from that cohort did that at their own um, study site, and then they sent the results to us centrally, and we beta analyzed them, which is a technique to combine the data. So we focused on dietary patterns because we um, we subscribe to the idea that you can't really measure the effect of nutrients in isolation because nutrients are usually part of food and the food is usually part of the diet and passion. So if you look at individual nutrients, you may not get a very clear um, idea of what the association is. That's why we look at the whole. And we looked at three healthy dietary patterns that are commonly used in the literature, the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, and the Alternative Health Eating Index. I'm not going to go into those dietary patterns very much, but they do differ from each other somewhat, but they have a lot of things in common. They promote um, vegetable intake, fruit, uh, fish, low intakes of meat, um, whole grains. So, um, a general health and diet pattern. Um, so, what's a harmonized beta analysis? Normally, what happens is um, if you want to conduct a combined analysis of existing um, data, you do a read of um, the literature and you gather all the statistics from all the papers that published and then you meta-analyze them. But you have little control about how the analysis was done, obviously, because you're working on something that might have been done five or six years ago. With a harmonized meta-analysis, you do that differently. You actually um, dictate or you um, decide beforehand how the analysis should be done in the original data sets. 
Um, and that helps because in this way you can reduce some of the uh, variation that's due to some design or to the composition of the um, uh, population or the way that the dietary patterns were defined. Because even though there is the Mediterranean dietary pattern, there are many, many ways of defining the di Mediterranean dietary pattern. And every study does it whenever they like it. Yeah. So what did we find? Um, this is the most important thing. This is the cross-sectional analysis. And I'm just showing the Mediterranean dietary um, pattern here, but it's consistent also with the other two dietary patterns. The important thing to look at is that big diamond on the bottom there, and the dotted line, I'm not sure if it's clear to everybody at the back, but there's a dotted line here. So on this side, the diamond on this side of the dotted line, which implies that if you it's a negative association, which means if you score highly on the Mediterranean diet, if you eat a healthy Mediterranean diet, you have less chance of depressive symptoms or less it's associated with lower depressive symptoms. It's measured at one time point. And this is where we're looking at um, there's only three cohorts, 11,000 participants. Um, when you're looking at um, the dietary pattern the baseline, and then after five or six years, looking at who developed depression, yes or no. And you will see that the diamond at the bottom is also to the left of the line, which implies that um, if you have a healthy dietary pattern, you are less likely to develop depression over time. Um, of course, this is observational um, data, so we see a consistent association. Um, we see that actually whether you're looking at depressive symptoms as a continuous phenomenon, <coughs> you can measure depressive symptoms on a scale, um, but you can also decide on a cutoff. Below this cut off, it's high depressive symptoms. Um, uh, above, it, above it, it's high. Below it's low. Um, so, using both those approaches, we saw consistent um, findings. Um, but, of course, this is um, observational data. So, we're only looking at what people report in questionnaires. Um, and um, you cannot completely unravel causality in this way. So, it's a limited um, level of evidence, but it's very consistent amongst these different um, cohorts from Australia, um, the UK, 